The second reason it doesn't work is that anything that's state imposed and the basic rule of life is whatever a government touches, I don't care what kind it is, whatever a government touches turns to doo-doo. So the goal is to have small government, so it's touching very little. You know, it should touch the military, it should touch certain things in infrastructure so that you got good roads, uh, it has to, you know, have foreign policy and a certain amount of commerce so that it can mobilize in time of war, which I'm going to get to in a minute. But other than that, you don't want a state run anything. Because when the state runs it, it, it basically operates t with too much bureaucracy. And secondly, it operates with a one-size-fits-all mentality because it needs to do that to standardize. So for a short period of time, like mobilizing war, that's, that's you know, really what Stalin and Mao did, is they mobilized the economy as if it were at a war, and they called it communism. Okay, for a short period of time that can work, but it can't work when you collectivize. You just can't make that work. You have to have uh, more f free um, interplay between the, the local people and the state, because the local people know the conditions on the ground. That's why s the politicians should never run war also, is that the generals have to run the war on the ground. You shouldn't have the politicians messing with it. So these are the reasons why communism doesn't work, and they're not the reasons that are related to human nature, okay? The reasons related to big entities. The bigger the entity, the more moribund it becomes. That's why you can't have a big state. You got to decentralize. The bigger the state, the more it has to decentralize. And communism is completely against all those ideas. All right? because Marx read history backwards. Communism works if it's voluntary and in a small number of groups for a short period of time, usually because of some kind of condition. And something similar to communism, which is a state-run uh, economy, um, can work if, for example, you're, you're mobilizing for war, like in the United States during World War I and II. Um, a lot of our industries were dictated to by the federal government and that we all agreed to that but we agreed to it okay and so the people locally coordinated with the federal government in order to figure out how many bullets to make how many uniforms to make and instead of having nylons and butter in as much supply as we used to we cut back on producing those things to divert the resources into making mil military you know materiel so that's a sort of like state-run, quasi-communistic, you know, idea. All right, so th that's the basic problem with the economic side of communism is, first of all, Marx is reading history backwards, and the bigger an entity, the more decentralized it needs to be. Um, the play of history is that you can do communism on a small scale for a short period of time, but as time progresses, even on a small scale, you have to start getting into private ownership. And it'll go through a cycle. It goes from communism to a kind of feudalism to a kind of state-run thing, and then capitalism. The capitalism is the high end of society, not the low end. Because by the time you get to a capitalistic state, where it's free enterprise with the state itself, the government itself, not controlling industry at all, okay, except in time of war, that the people have grown up enough to respect private property, to respect competition, to respect hard work on their own. Okay, a person wants to own things that he produces. Okay, that's basic human nature. If I produce something, I want to own the results. Now, what's supposed to go with that is a kind of nobility of character, that as you work hard and you produce things and you come to own things, you start to appreciate those around you who were not so fortunate. And there's a sort of grace attitude. They call it noblesse oblige. And you're supposed to have a sort of grace attitude, and you basically want to start giving to charity and stuff like that for those who are not as fortunate as you. And that's what capitalism is supposed to foster. And it does foster that. You can see that kind of thing play out in the history of Rome. You can see it play out in earlier societies in that, you know, um, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. 
You know, they did a lot of charitable works. Even the Hittites and the Assyrians, you know, ended up getting into that. Even Egypt, all right? And Egypt was pretty, you know, um, at times, you know, very hung up on the state run. But most of those pro those past economies were very feudal in nature. But the bigger they became, the more decentralized they became. And therefore, there was more free enterprise, more local control, and more charity. All right, so they became more capitalistic as they sort of grew up in appreciating what it meant to be rich and what it meant to own a lot of property. That's the way it's supposed to go. Okay, and that keys to human nature. Human nature is not noble, but it, but as your needs are met, you start to become more noble than you were. You start to become less selfish. Okay, because when you're starving, you're selfish. You can't almost help it. Okay, as you stop, you start having things, you start being comfortable, you start, you know, being more noble and thinking about, you know, life and the meaning of life and your fellow man. All right, and that's where charity comes in. So capitalism is at the high end of a civilization. And inevitably, as we've seen many times in history, um, this high end of civilization reaches a peak and the people start to become greedy again at both top and bottom and then descends back into state-run feudalism and eventually communism because the, everybody's so broken up with famine and disaster because people aren't you know um, noble anymore okay from top to bottom and we saw that story play over and over again pick any area of the world you want look at its history and you'll see that happen